<laughs> Card out, McGurgan. Well, hello, Michelle. Geordie, Geordie. Hello, hello. You little spunkish. Oh. <laughs> I'm a spunkit. I feel like I've grown up a bit now, so I'm an older spunk. So what does that make me? A grand spunk. A grand spunkish? <laughs> a brand spanking spunkish. Spunketty. Spelunking. Spelunking. A spelunking spunketter. A spunketter. I don't know. Does anyone know what we're talking about? We've already started off rambling. How about that? <laughs> That's a record. We've been rambling for years. Years long. <laughs> Telling you. So, Michelle, first of all, let's just kick off by introducing ourselves. Obviously, you're Michelle. And you're Geordie. And together, we're the eavesdropping duo. <laughs> That's right. We're your hosts on this little ride, a little chitty chatty ride where we discuss all sorts of things such as real life, supernatural, true real crime. life, <laughs> supernatural. True crime, all of the above and the extras. And of course, don't forget the facts will be slightly skew if. So as we often say, do not repeat with confidence. Just sit back and enjoy and have a laugh. That's right, because you might go to that dinner party, you might spill off that or spool off that fact. And you'll be shot down in flames. Dinner party kamikaze, as we call it. Dinner party kamikaze, that's right. Dirty poo. Don't say that one at a dinner party. Don't say that. That's not correct. Don't say that. It's no. not correct. Dirt did not appear on this planet because of lots of people doing poos. That's not what happened. Geordie, you stupid bitch. Honestly. That is not what happened. And Neil, the scientist, didn't even get in touch. He didn't bother. He just knew it was so ridiculous. <laughs> I think we debunked ourselves mid-sentence. We That's did. a previous episode, if you've just joined us. If you've just joined us, I do feel a little bit sorry for you because obviously you won't you won't understand a lot of the references. So we'll do our best to explain it. But let me just say that we do have an Instagram page, which I adore. I love that Instagram page. It's full of fun things. We get a lot of people calling and writing in. We've recently had some messages from the lovely Safka. I've had another message from the lovely Shari. Charlene is a constant writer. I have little chats with them as well because I run that account because I can't respond to the emails, Michelle. There was an email as well. There was an email from our darling white witch, Telly Wrecker, Safka. I've not been that good at replying to messages, but I reply in the podcast. So yeah, we know she's listening. You get a twofer. And in fact, calling you a spunkette was a little reference to Safka's message because she said, Hey, Spunkettes to us. She did. Because she'd been listening to the Avicii and Brian Jones episode. And she says, oddly fabulous pod today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Safka, for listening. And she recommended a great documentary on Anita Pallenberg called Catching Fire, the story of Anita Pallenberg. Because we did say we wanted to dig a bit deeper into Anita Pallenberg's life because she's such a fascinating character. Indeed. And so we ask, Safka delivered. She's given sure us did. a telly wreck. So I'm going to have to watch that. You will too. And we can uh, pin that for a future episode. It sounds good. And if you are ever struggling for television shows to watch, Michelle has collated or collected or I don't know what you've done on the Patreon. <laughs> you've made a list. I've made a list and I'm checking it twice. I've put all of the... <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're naughty or nice. If you're on the Patreon, you can get hold of all the telly wrecks where the wrecks that we talk about, people write in. It's all there. And I update the same document every week so you don't have to go trawling through. It's just all there. You just hashtag telly wrecks. I have a wreck. You have a wreck. Go. I have a wreck. We just started it. And yes, I did fall asleep last night whilst watching it. But it was a wreck from Tim the Magic Music Man, which luckily my husband recalled because we were sitting there going, we've got nothing to watch. We tried it and it does look intriguing. It's a foreign, foreign film. It's German. And it's not a film. It's a TV show. It's on Netflix. It's called Dark. Dark. What's it about? Bit of a supernatural I, I'm not quite sure, Michelle, because like I said, I did have a little nap <laughs> in the middle of it. But I, I got caught up afterwards from my husband. It looks like it's been shot in the early morning. Oh. But there's a man 
who took his own life at the beginning of it. It seems that they all live in this town, which is quite rural, and there's a massive nuclear power plant. Oh, Jesus. One of those. And they're about to shut it down. Okay. And there's a child missing, all of that stuff. Okay. But confusing because I hate to say this, it sounds awful, but a few of the characters look the same as each other, so I got a little <laughs> bit confused. Okay, Nana, you just take that nap and it'll all <laughs> become clear later. <laughs> so I had a nap, exactly. <laughs> but I'm going to return to it tonight, looking forward to it, because it has that kind of supernatural element that I quite like. And I think it's made by the same people that did the show about the boats, 1896 or something. Oh, There's some numbers in it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I do know about that. Well, great. Thanks for that telly wreck. I will pop that Pleasure. on the Patreon. Pop it on. I've got a couple of telly wrecks here. Well, it's not really a wreck. It's just a, a comment from Safka. Oh. Going back to this Anita Pallenberg, she says... She's not impressed that Barbarella is being remade with Sydney Sweeney. Well, if anyone should remake it and, and be stepping into Jane Fonda's shoes, then perhaps it's that girl. Well, she's got the tits. I'll tell you that for a start. Well, I don't know about her tits, but I thought she looked a bit like her. She's that doll face that, that Fonda had back then, the big hair. Uh, I don't think that's what people know her for. I mean, if you have seen Euphoria, you will know she has... Massive boobs. Good oh. for her. I'm sure it gives her a backache. Congratulations. Oh, not for the backache. No, congratulations for that. Congratulations for owning them, I guess. Yeah. Well done. For growing them. And I don't mean owning them as in possessing them. I oh, mean, I see. Like, I own it, girl. <laughs> I got the boobs. <laughs> and she's not afraid to like wow. plop them out in euphoria. But Safka says, I don't see how that movie would work with today's wokeness. Right. Well, I don't even remember Barbarella, the proper story of it. I remember seeing it many moons ago. It's quite sexy and she is a bit of an object. That's basically it. Right. And there's no plot and it's really dull, but the costumes are fantastic. Jane Fonda, I could just stare at her face and her body forever in that film. She was absolutely stunning. And in fact, Safka says, I had such a crush on Jane Fonda and Barbarella as a kid and the evil dolls scared the crap all out of me. surprised. Well, I'm not surprised either. Yeah, so that's one to look out for, yep. I guess. Maybe I'll link up a few things with Sydney Sweeney in because she's been in some stuff. I also want to say I had a few eavesdroppers get in touch saying, how has Jordy never heard an Avicii song, first of all? Oh, <laughs> well, since I did the social media, I realised that I did know some of the tunes, but they're instrumentals. They are instrumentals, but you can sing along to those instrumentals. They're very melodic. Okay. A few people have said they've been inspired to watch the documentary. Oh. However, I did have a comment from Eve's Dropper Steph. Mm. Now, if you remember, she did recommend the Celine yes. Dion documentary. So, yeah. I said... You bagged it. Meow, meow, not sure I can get through it. I only yeah. got halfway through it. Now, she said to me... You bitch. You bitch. You shot me down and you need to give it another go <laughs> because <laughs> she said you need to watch to the end oh. because there's something really fucking shocking oh, that happens okay. at the end. And she said, you've got to stick with it because you just see this woman. She's in total denial of her condition. Oh, God. And what happens at the end is utterly harrowing. Jeez. You just see this woman unravel and unable to cope with who she is now, oh knowing God. that she will never get her old life back. Harrowing is the word Eastrop oh. Steph said. Wow. Okay. Well, you pulled the cord too soon, Michelle. I did maybe pull the cord too soon. So apologies to <laughs> Eastrop Steph. I'm going to watch that bitch right to the end and then I'm going to oh. give another update. Poor bitch. Poor bitch. <laughs> Sounds like she's having an awful time. Terrible time. Speaking of eavesdroppers, aka eavesdropper Jen, just want to give a little shout out. Oh. Oh, Jen. She's in the hospital. She's not well. So good vibes, Jen. Healing vibes for Jen. Hopefully she's got her earplugs in in the hospital giggling away. <laughs> I hope so. She can tell all those bloody nurses, my daughter's got a podcast and you should listen to it. It's called <laughs> eavesdropping. One for the whole ward. <laughs> eavesdropping. <laughs> I know she'll start singing the little outro song. Sing along. She'll be laughing. Oh, Jen, I do hope you feel better soon. And all of the listeners who adore Jen and love Jen also will be sending their love to you as well. Get well soon, Jen. And just pick up your panties and get out of that hospital as soon as you can. Pick up your panties and go, Jen. Pick up your panties and go. You don't need that. Leave the kids behind! 
pick up your panties and go. Uh, Michelle, we've got some new followers on Instagram and I'd just like to give a warm <laughs> welcome because they've liked every single post. So welcome, Mr. Elon Musk. We <laughs> hope that you're converted to being a listener. And hey, did you know about our Patreon page? I think you could afford to buy us a few coffees, actually. So why don't you pop on over, Mr. Elon Musk? Even better, send us a couple of Teslas. We'd love it. We'll take them. <laughs> If you need any advertising, we're always happy to do that, by the way, for a fee. We're not going to give you any more shout outs for your bloody car until you start paying us. So, Elon, step it up. Well, actually, no, welcome. Welcome, Elon. We don't know if you're real or not. But, Michelle, normally when Keanu Reeves or Stuart Copeland messages me, (laughs) I know pretty quickly by the tone and the things they say and by looking at their account and how many followers they have or don't have in, in most cases, I can tell it's not them. But Michelle, Mr. Elon Musk, it linked to his ex account and he's got a lot of followers and he's got a blue tick. No. Elon, are you serious? Do you know what? It's probably because he loves the supernatural. Does he? He's listening to us. Well, he does love the supernatural. I mean, he goes into space, for God's sake. He created like a whole bloody missile. I felt like that's more scientific than supernatural. Elon, we're now having an argument. You need to step in and like <laughs> sort this out. Tell us, do you like the supernatural? Yeah. Now, if he's got a blue tick, Elon, we love you. Sorry. Pop a coin in that jar first. Pop a coin in, yeah. Pop a coin in. Send over those Teslas. We'll love you even more. <laughs> Welcome, Elon. <laughs> Welcome. So, for anyone who thinks... Michelle sounds like she's in a big echoey room today. She is. Well, it's because I'm not in my normal recording habitat. I am in a little tiny uh, summer house in Sweden, probably got Skara Cannibal and Cannibal. Knocking on your door. Cannibal living next door to Coming me. Coming around for a cup of meat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fucking hell. For a little chomp chomp. Oh, God. Apologies if, uh, if this sounds a little roomy. I'm just going to dive right in, Geordie. It's a big one. Well, it is a big one, but I can't do justice to how big this story is. I've titled this story, The Spy Who Loved Me. Today, I'm just looking at this story that rocked the UK when it was blown wide fucking open a few years ago. And it is the story of the spy cops undercover police scandal. Fascinating. If you lived in the UK, you could not have gone without noticing this story. It was yeah. everywhere. It was huge. Undercover cops. Undercover cops. And I came across it a few years ago when obviously it was all over the news, internationally too. Yeah. And then I recently was looking for some podcast, you know, cleaning kind of talk because I I listen to my podcasts when I clean and I'd already listened to eavesdropping. So I was like, what am I going to listen to next? Love that you listen to yourself while you're cleaning. <laughs> it's the ones that are coming up because I've got to make sure we uh, we sound all right. Right. You know, every now and again, I do pop on an eavesdropping. See how good we used to be? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> this podcast, um, I came across it. It's called Bed of Lies. Season oh, one. Okay. This is a good recommendation by the sound of it. It is. It's a podcast rec where a reporter called Cara McGugan, great name, McGugan, <laughs> she really goes, McGugan goes deep into this whole <laughs> spy cops scandal. <laughs> Go deep, McGugan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that tickled me so much. It's probably a very serious and sad story, people. We're not being disrespectful. It's just Michelle's ridiculous. It is. And honestly, if you came here for respectful and sensitive coverage of serious things, we give you some laughs, peeps. Yeah. Go somewhere else if you if you want to cry, although you might cry because this is really bloody horrible. Go to a Coldplay concert. <laughs> a sky full of ass. Anyway, going back to this spy cop story, this story is so entrenched in government mystery and scandal. And it's so fucking shocking that I I didn't even know where to start with it. So I'm going to go micro and I'm going to start with the story of Lisa Jones, not her real name, because I think this is going to give you a flavor of where this whole scandal is, is heading. In July 2010, she went to the Italian Alps. Gorgeous. If you haven't been there, you know, it's absolutely stunning. She went there for a holiday with her boyfriend 
she'd been going out with this guy, Mark Stone, for six years. And they were having a brilliant time in the Alps. They were hiking. They were enjoying nature. They were enjoying each other because... God, Michelle. Just really in love. And right. it was just kind of this holiday, a bit of a break from their, you know, the grind of their daily lives. The pair were both environmental and social justice activists who regularly protested for environmental, anti capitalist, anti nuclear campaigns. Is it Greenpeace? In the articles I read, they won't list the organizations that these right. people were part of. I think one of them is. In this documentary I listened to, the podcast, even things like Black Lives Matter were part of this. Any kind of group that protests against social injustice, yep. things like that, climate, etc. Anti-capitalist, anti-nuclear, all that stuff. So they were doing all of this, but they were also holding down, you know, normal lives with, you know, kind of normal jobs. They're just passionate people who care about the planet. And the causes that really mean something to them. Mark and... Lisa, alias Lisa, they first met in Leeds in the autumn of 2003. Lisa was already living in Leeds and Mark was in Leeds um, for a protest. At that point, Lisa was in her early 30s and when she first met Mark, she thought, "Mm, this guy's kind of charming, he's friendly, he's really likeable, he's into the same stuff I'm into And he kind of courted her in a very low-key, kind of unassuming way, which she really liked. They got together fairly quickly. And according to her in 2003, they were blissfully happy for about six years, going on seven. Oh, six years. Six years. Wow, that's a stretch. So going back to this holiday in the Italian Alps... Like I said, they'd been hiking and climbing on this holiday. There are pictures of them looking like so in love, big smiles, arms around each other, hiking gear, carabiners on them, you know, all the harnesses and whatnot. They just look so happy to be together and be in the mountains. But at one point on this holiday, Lisa realized she'd left her sunnies, sunglasses in the car. So she went back to the car to look for them and she was just rooting around in the glove box when she saw the leather cover of a British passport and she thought oh I wonder what Mark's passport photo looks like so she opens up this passport there's Mark smiling but it's a different name he's not called Mark Stone he's called Mark Kennedy in this passport (gasps) oh she's like what the fuck is this if that's not fucked up enough in that glove box she then found a mobile phone she'd never seen before. Oh, no. That had messages on the screen. Yeah. It was basically messages from two kids saying, Dad, Dad this, Dad that. Oh, my goodness. Calling her boyfriend, Dad. Oh, wow. Lisa just went into complete shock. I mean, she was like, what the fuck am I seeing here? (gasps) And I think she must have been totally unable to process what she was seeing, what the information meant, because I think she was kind of emotionally paralyzed by this weird discovery. And I cannot imagine how she could have or would have felt because you've been seeing someone for six years and then you you find a secret phone and a passport with a different name. And you're like, it's crazy. Who is my boyfriend? And does he have two fucking kids? Yeah. That you don't know about for some reason after six years. Turns out, Mark Stone's real name is actually Mark Kennedy. Yeah. And he was married, is married. Is. And is a dad of two. And turns out Mark is an undercover cop. Yeah. Who had been sent to spy on Lisa and the activist groups that she was a part of. And more than that, for seven years, Mark had gone from this clean-shaven policeman to this kind of long-haired, crusty guy with piercings and flanny shirts. And he adopted this whole fake persona under the instruction of the government. And he was tasked with infiltrating environmental groups. And he did it by basically setting this honey trap and luring people like Lisa into fake relationships in order to extract intelligence about the group. And how the fuck does his wife and kids feel about that? That is the question that everyone asks. 
the wife and kids, from what I read and kind of understood from the podcast, they knew their husband was doing top secret work. They had no fucking clue. He was shagging someone else on the side. And there are children out of these relationships. I know that from the coverage that we've got here in the UK. Some of those relationships resulted in children being born. Exactly. So it's so fucking duplicitous. It's this whole double life. I just want to unpack this a little bit because basically Lisa was this small time activist who was not breaking any laws. She was just an ordinary woman who was standing up for what she believed in. She met a guy who made it very clear and made moves on her, was totally interested in her. She ends up falling in love with this man manipulated into falling in love with this man who she believed had all the same ideals as her, was protesting for all the same causes as her and even moved in together. Except it's all a lie. Lisa, along with hundreds, Geordie, hundreds of women around the UK were the targets of an intelligence gathering operation instigated by the UK's Met Police Force under the guidance of the UK government. Yeah, It's fucked up. It is totally fucked up. But I will say, though, at this point, Michelle, that we did a story on the Brixton bomber. The government and the police force only really found out about certain underground groups and found the bomber because there was somebody infiltrating the groups, the far right groups. They weren't sleeping with people. They were just attending the rallies, though. So why That's do the they have to go all that way and use subterfuge to the extent that these people had to do? Exactly. That is exactly my point, too. Like, go to the fucking rallies. Be friends with Lisa. Yeah. But you don't need to fuck her and be in a relationship for six yes. plus years. You can have a separate life and still attend these rallies and still get the info that you require. You're not going to get much info at home in bed with some poor woman who trusts you. I know. I mean, it's so fucked up because she and all these other women were deceived into having these long-term sexual relationships with undercover cops who never loved them. Terrible. Those dudes were just doing a job. Yeah, big fucking job. In, out, mate. (laughs) I know, but it's true. And also... Lisa was in, I think, her early 30s when she met him. Yeah. Do you know how cheated she must have felt by having those years robbed? Yeah. Where she could have met someone who really loved her, maybe wanted to start a family. Yeah. All of those things were taken away from this woman because she was manipulated into this relationship. Yeah. And honestly, the trauma these women must have faced when they realized that their relationships were 100% a complete and Shame. utter lie. Yeah. It must be beyond devastating, especially when they kind of looked at the whole picture, which was bigger than just being deceived in a relationship. This guy Mark Kennedy, under the alter ego of Mark Stone, deliberately manipulated Lisa into a relationship instigated by the Met, overseen by the Met, Mm -hmm. supervised by the Met because he was checking in with his handlers on a daily basis for seven years. What about his fucking mental health? Living that lie. It's crazy. And how much info did he, Mark Stone, uncover that was useful? I don't know. A lot of these guys stopped tiny little protests and not much. It was a big, expensive effort for what I could understand from the podcast I listened to, not much gain. He's essentially being paid to create a double life and be in a relationship with his target to the point where his deception led him to have a fake ID. He had training in how to be an undercover cop and fit in with activists. Hmm. And he was paid overtime for his troubles. Just for sleeping with someone. Wow. Yep. In an article I read in The Guardian, from the perspective of two of the women who were targeted by the Met, they say that basically they had absolutely no idea they were deceived into fake relationships where their partners were checking in daily with, you know, the police. And they had absolutely no idea that their movements, all their communication were being tracked by the government. The government was being told everything, you know, what they were doing, They wanted to know all about their sex lives, their intimate lives, everything was on the table. You know, you're in a relationship with this guy you thought you knew 
And all along, it was fake and he was spying on you the whole time. It's totally fucked up. So when Lisa discovered that passport and the messages from Mark's kids, she confronted him. And she was like, what the fuck is this? And he made up this bullshit story of how he had a dodgy past as a drugs mule. He had loads of fake passports. You know, oh, these kids were actually just the kids of a friend who called him dad. But they're not his wow. kids. You know, the passport she found was just a remnant from his drug muling days, whatever you call As it. if you'd bring it on holiday. I know. You know, you can see he's like freaking out, trying to backtrack and panic how to get out of it. She says she believed it because she wanted to believe it oh, and no. she loved him. But deep down, she did know it was bullshit. Yeah. Eventually, he left her pretty soon after that because right. basically he would have told his handlers She's found out about me. I've been compromised. Yeah, Yeah, I've been compromised. And they're like, exit strategy, get the fuck out. So he was out of there pretty quickly. And she eventually unraveled one of the biggest secrets in British policing history. Because the Met and the government say, we never authorized these relationships. But if you're (gasps) checking in every fucking day with your handlers, you know what's going on, right? They were just keeping it all on the down low. And continuing to put agents out in the field to target women to get intel via fake relationships. You know, these women, on the whole, were not even kind of the activist kingpins. They were just run-of-the-mill protesters who were in these groups, but they weren't the leaders. No. Once this whole scandal was exposed, they could not wrap their head around why they personally had been targeted. Because they were small fry in the whole scheme of things. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, does it? No. And the thing is that the Met had been running this covert operation since 1968. And it was such a deep state secret that only a really tiny number of senior police officers even knew this whole group existed of, you know, surveillance cops who were having relationships. And Mark Kennedy, aka Mark Stone, was just one of more than a hundred other undercover cops who for more than 40 years grew their hair long, got some tats, got a few piercings, bought a transit van. And it's really (laughs) interesting because they talk about this in the podcast about the transit van. They say, these activists have no money and no transport. Get a transit van and you will immediately be ingratiated into the group yeah. because you'll be able to give them lifts. It was that calculated. So they all got a transit van. They transformed themselves into fake campaigners and not just for a few rallies, for years and years and years. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. No. Yes, they were doing it to kind of thwart shit that was going on before it got off the ground. But I will say, Geordie, it is a fundamental tenet of democracy that people have the right to free speech and to demonstrate absolutely let's not forget that yeah in this day and age because it is not possible for every single person on this planet to agree on everything all the time so people have the right to protest and make their dislike for something known i think you know obviously you have got undercover people in groups like the National Front, not that they exist anymore, but when they did, and other hate groups who are known for their violent clashes or their violent ideology, Mm. whereas Greenpeace, I suppose they have caused a couple of international incidences. So it's fair enough to have someone infiltrate, but not to that extent. No. Of course, I understand if they want to have a couple of people keeping an eye on certain things. Of course, it makes sense for national security. I get it. But don't go all that way. That's stupid. No. In this podcast, did you ever hear from any of the actual undercover policemen? I'd love to hear their side of it. There was one guy who spoke a little bit about it. Um, There was also a guy who they tried to recruit. And once he realized what was going on, was like, fuck this. This is fucked up and I'm not doing it. So you do hear the voices of the men. But if you go online and you read articles, you will see that they all say, my life has been ruined by my cover being blown. Yeah. Well, do you know what? Sure. You ruined the lives of these women by lying to them yeah. and making them feel loved. Everyone's lives are ruined. It's appalling. I cannot stand behind what these guys did. And these poor women, they ended up being literally fucked 
by the police. Yeah. You know, it, it is heartbreaking. Yeah. And what's more, it's not just that these women had serious, intimate, fake relationships with these undercover cops. Like you had said before, some of them had babies with the partners. Yeah. The lines are blurred. Some of them went to relationship counselling. Can you imagine wow. that? Sitting in front of a counsellor, uh-huh. your partner's there saying, I feel like you're not giving me 100% and you're the fake dude in this fake relationship kind of thinking, I have to navigate this really carefully. I wonder if the counsellor was able to pick up on any of that subterfuge. God knows. But you know, the lines are totally blurred and it's all sanctioned by the government who thought that this yep. fucked up scenario was worth it for the greater good. But Geordie... Awful. Like we talked about in previous episodes, the cultural landscape, it's something that is always shifting. It's kind of a bit like a volcano. You go along, there's a few rumbles here and there, and then suddenly it explodes and, you know, the result is chaos. And that's what's happened here. And it's far reaching. Yes. Because I think for decades, different time, different cultural landscape, they probably thought, It's fine. It's a little bit of a perk, maybe. Fucking hell. You know, it's not like that. People's mindsets have changed. If ever it was considered to be acceptable, it's definitely not fucking acceptable now. No, absolutely. There was actually a manual on how to infiltrate these groups and recruit these women or manipulate these women. And it was called the SDS Tradecraft Manual. And Jordi, it's disgusting. It's a 44-page guide written by an undercover cop called Andy Coles, who was also out in the field with a new name, loads of fake relationships, because he would, you know, have a relationship with someone, realize he had to pull out for whatever reason, go on to the next woman in a different town. Mm -mm. This trade craft manual went into detail about so many things, more things than I have time to talk about here. But a few examples of how revolting this manual was is the whole guide has this superior tone to it about the police are definitely superior to the people they're spying on. And they call the protesters the wearies because what these people are so fucking boring. These protesters are so fucking boring. They're so wearisome. <gasps> they're the wearies, but you have to just put oh up with goodness. them. It's awful. The spy cops called themselves the Harrys because in order to fit in, they had to grow their hair, grow a beard. So they called themselves right. the Harrys so they could blend in. And they were encouraged. This is what I found really foul. They were encouraged to find a fake name that could be used, you know, as their operative name. So they were told it's easier to use your first name because then you're less likely to yeah. feel like, who, what? Mess up. But to find yeah. a second name... What they would do, they said, a good way to find a suitable, untraceable surname is to trawl through births, deaths and marriages and basically find the birth certificate of a dead child. Yeah, that's what they do. A child that had died early, who potentially had no living relatives. I just think that's horrendous. And basically in the manual, it said, after you find the dead child's birth certificate and you establish that the relatives of the kid are either dead or living in an obscure place you can then claim squatters rights on that identity that's what they said it was a joke to them yeah these dudes in the field were only meant to assume these fake identities for four years but they didn't they went on for years and years and these poor women who believed they were in loving relationships were with spies who'd stolen the identities of dead children it's just sickening i know it's appalling Then there's just all this stuff about you have to remember that the activists stink. They don't wash. You know, they're coarse. They use foul language. They drink too much. They're alcoholic. Like all of this stuff. Basically, there was one line that said, don't wash your body or your clothes if you want to fit in. No. All of these ridiculous preconceived ideas. And they said, if you have a relationship, it has to be fleeting and disastrous. And you only do it in order to not blow your cover. But that's like seven years worth of relationships with children being born. Exactly. So it's totally fucked up. Someone missed the brief. So with all that in mind, when the scandal blew up, before COVID actually, the police under the Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, agreed to give these deceived women a full apology and pay compensation to eight of these traumatised women who got together and went to the Met and said, 
you can't treat us like this. You know, we've been deceived into forming these relationships with police spies because these women were fucked up, Geordie. They had trust issues. They had PTSD. Mm. They had difficulties forming new relationships. They had anxiety and stress and loads of other mental health issues. As Lisa says, she was one of the women who got some money out of this. She said, no amount of money or sorry will make up for the lack of answers about the extent to which I was spied upon in every aspect of my most personal and intimate moments. And you know, she'll never get that time back to be with someone who actually loved her. Yeah. So what I would say is anyone who has an interest piqued by this story and want to have a deeper look at it, I'll link up the Bed of Lies podcast because in every episode, when you think it can't get worse, it does. And they go into loads of personal stories of women who were deceived. And it's just a really well done podcast, but it's fucking upsetting. That's amazing, Michelle. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you telling us that because it's a fascinating story and I've always wanted to know more. So well done. I'll go and check it out. Bullshit. So on the same kind of theme, Michelle... I too listened to a podcast and it was recommended to me through an article that a listener sent through and it was from Janneke from Amsterdam who sent me this intriguing BBC news story about how a mysterious punk frontman from Suffolk became an international fugitive. So that article then sent me (laughs) down the road of listening to an excellent podcast called Dead Man Running, which is on BBC Sounds at the moment, and it's by an investigative journalist called Miles Bonner. And there is a trigger for this podcast. There's descriptions of rape, sexual assault and suicide and self-harm. So I'm keeping all that to a very minimum for this story, because like you, there is so much to this. And I don't want to spoil it for those of you who want to go and listen to Dead Man Running on BBC Sounds. So I'm going to do a little condensed version myself of this story, which is fascinating. And it begins in Inverness, which is where the host and journalist, Miles Bonner, grew up. So the story is important to him because it forms part of his history, I guess. Inverness, by the way, is in the very northern part of the Scottish Highlands. And it's also where Loch Ness is based. Yes. Miles Bonner remembers a local eccentric with a weird accent who used to be busking in the town centre. His name was Kim Gordon or Kim Avis. And later on, we find out there's also a possibility that his name is Vince Avis as well. So we already know something's amiss, right? Because of the names all flippy flippy. And also too, Kim Gordon is the bass guitarist for Sonic Youth. (laughs) Did he steal the name? Well, you'll find out as I tell you more. But the Mm. busking... For a start, you do get to hear a snippet of it. Somehow there were some recordings of it. It was so appalling that people would pay him to (laughs) shut up. However, he won the locals over by raising money for charity. The councillors of the town were so happy for him because he was doing all this lovely charitable work, like swimming the width of Loch Ness, amongst other things. And he'd appear in the press and he got himself a really good reputation. And the townspeople came to respect this character who also sold jewellery at a stall in the town centre, despite owning a massive house with land, by the way, Michelle. So some people just assumed that he was this super rich Trostafarian, crusty Mm -hmm. guy, a little bit like somebody who might have been one of your policemen in the Greenpeace rallies. Also, Avis was obsessed with wolves and he raised wolf-like dogs and called his house the Wolf's Den. And he thought of himself as a lone wolf. So he was a real character. He's alternative looking as well. So he had this huge following of young goths who thought that Kim was great. And this was when he was in his 40s. Except there was a dark side to Kim Avis. Oh dear. Like your policeman, he owned not a transit, but he had a panel van and it was all kitted out with a bed and it became known that he liked to offer lifts to teenage girls and coerce them to get into the back of his van no oh my god what a fucking creep he would also offer to show tourists Loch Ness but withheld the return journey until they gave him what he wanted and that was sex sometimes he took that against their will I'm afraid what a creep yeah quite a creepy guy in the bin 
There's a girl who's 14 years old called Emma, not her real name, who met him on the street at his stall. And she had recently come out, like come out as a lesbian. But this intrigued him. Mm -hmm. So he ended up inviting her into the back of his van, which freaked her out. So she just avoided him from then on. But then there was another 14-year-old that reported to the podcast that she'd been invited to see some jewellery in his panel van. But when she looked inside, there was no jewellery, just a mattress and bedding and all that kind of stuff. And he tried to push her in, but thankfully (gasps) she ran away. Oh, thank God. Someone who wasn't so lucky was Jade, and that is her real name. She met him in the town centre when she was 15, when a bunch of her teenage friends would hang around him. And one day he kissed her, which she didn't mind. She thought it was quite nice because, you know, he was this guy that they all looked up to. But shortly after, she developed social anxiety, which lasted till she was around 17. So she disappeared off the scene for a bit. And when she returned, she did see him again in the town centre. They swapped numbers. And within weeks, they were in a relationship together, despite him having another partner and children ensconced back at the wolf's den his property christ this guy was he good looking have you seen pictures of him yeah i have no it's not for me (laughs) but it's 2005 she's 18 he's 42 and he began to isolate her from her friends and family and would threaten her male friends before he moved her into a static caravan in the woods while he stayed in the wolf's den with his other family jade couldn't drive And he held on to her bank card. So he'd often leave her at this secluded caravan for long periods of time. So she couldn't go anywhere and she'd only see him. He'd be off buying groceries with her bank card and would just occasionally come and bring the groceries and, uh, yeah, then have his way with her and things like that. And after a little while, she began to get wind of what was going on and told him she didn't want to sleep with him anymore. Yeah. But he wasn't accepting of that. So to cut a long and distressing story short... Jade went to the police in 2015 and a police investigation was launched, which prompted three more women to come forward because basically he raped her. Oh, God, this is so awful. I mean, this guy has basically kidnapped her in a roundabout way and coerced her. Well, she was a willing participant to a certain degree that she was being coerced, yeah. She was being coerced and she also didn't sign up for complete isolation, having her bank cards taken away, unable to leave this cabin in the fucking middle of nowhere he did end up moving her into the wolf's den at some point where he kind of had a relationship with two women at once and she was helping to look after the children and by 2017 multiple charges of rape and sexual assault were brought against avis by several other women right and the trial date was set for march 2019 but by then 57 year old avis he didn't plan on attending michelle in fact Avis sold his massive Highland house, the Wolf's Den, and bought tickets for himself and his 17-year-old son to fly to L.A., where he hatched a scheme to fake his own death before assuming a new identity and starting over. What? But how can he think that this is possible in this day and age with a digital footprint? It's ridiculous. He's such an unusual chap that I think he kind of gets away with a lot of stuff during his lifetime. So this is not out of the realms of possibility for him. Okay. And he brought his teenage son, Ruben, along with him to help him pull the whole thing off. So it was Ruben who, in a 911 call to police, told them that his dad was last seen going for a swim at a beach in Carmel, California. This beach was so notorious for drownings that it was given its name Mortuary Beach because it was so deathly. Yeah. Obviously, police arrived. There was a two-day search involving 95 man hours. <gasps> 20 dive operations were launched. Yeah. And, then inv- and then investigators began to get sus because when they grilled Ruben, he didn't appear upset enough. Plus, he couldn't explain where their rental car had disappeared to or where they were staying right. or what their itinerary was. All of that stuff. Okay. And it wasn't like he was 12. He was 18. He's 17. 17. He's got enough now to be able to answer those questions. Suspicions were raised even higher, Michelle, when Ruben refused to hand over Kim's phone. And then it came to light that his father apparently walked into the ocean while wearing his passport on a lanyard while his son went for a hike, in inverted commas. Oh my God, this is getting stupid. (laughs) It's pretty crazy. Eventually the search was called off and information from Scotland filtered through to the United States 
which told those guys that Kim Abis didn't show up to his court date. Mm. So the US now are aware that they have a fugitive yeah. on the run. Yep. So a manhunt was launched to capture him. While all this is going on, Avis is having a fine time traveling around the US, sleeping on park benches, and then he bought a van, and then he arrived in Colorado Springs and met a lady called Angie, who was a street gemstone trader, much like him. So he was very much in that kind of alternative street kind of vibe thing. So he found someone else who was quite similar to him. And he told her that his name was Cameron McGregor, another name change, <laughs> and invited to see <laughs> and invited her to see his camper van, which is also mm. fully equipped with a bed. She got a bad vibe, but nevertheless, the two became friendly and possibly intimate. Okay. But something about Avis always creeped Angie out. So she was particularly aware that he was carting around with him about $50,000 worth of cash, tightly wrapped in plastic. Mm -hmm. So one day when she heard about Avis the fugitive, she wondered if maybe McGregor could be the same guy. So she did something. She reported his plates (gasps) to police. Oh, wow. Okay, brave. They were supposed to meet up in a hotel for a hookup. And instead of Angie, the police were lying in wait. (gasps) So Avis was immediately arrested and taken off to a prison holding cell. Wow. Go Angie. Angie, though, she's still intrigued and she wanted to find him in this federal prison. So she wrote him a letter and asked him to tell her the truth. And his response was that he was being framed for cash by women (laughs) in the UK, which Angie believed at first. But bit by bit, she began to see the light. Of course. In addition to this podcast, there's also a BBC documentary which aired in April this year, 2024, called Disclosure, Dead Man Running. Miles Bonner does a lot of investigative journalism for the Disclosure programs, and I haven't seen them recently, but I'm really keen to see more of his stuff because this was a great podcast, Michelle. Yeah, I'll have to listen. This story is crazy. Yeah. But after that, Miles Bonner began to receive information after the TV show was aired, the documentary. Regarding Avis's life, before he apparently rode in to Inverness on horseback, which was legend. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This guy, he loves the theatrics. There was a former teenage punk from the 80s called Paul Devine who got in touch with with the program makers. And he was in a punk band called Cult of the Head from Bury St. Edmunds in Suffolk. And they apparently had some success. It's like, you know, small town success. And he told Bonner that Vince Avis, not Kim, was the lead singer in his band. Cult of the Head. (laughs) Cult of the Head. Well, there's other names that make sense around that time. If you listen to the music, it makes perfect sense. It's quite dark, kind of gothy music. So the people that knew him from Suffolk, they mostly say they never saw anyone like him. Like he had the first Mohican in the area. And most people thought he was a really great guy. He didn't live with parents. I think he lived in an unusual situation, maybe near his sister or on a big piece of land in a house next to a cottage kind of thing. He was pretty much left to his own devices. And yeah. something that Miles Bonner tried to find out was his family background. Why did he always have money? And when he was arrested, obviously, he had this wadge of cash on him, the $50,000 or maybe even more. Yeah. And then there was that massive house in Inverness. So there's all this money, unknown info. Yeah. Was the family wealthy? But he did discover that his real name. So Miles Bonner did discover that his real name was Kim Vincent Avis. Did he rob some banks? That's the one thing (laughs) that he found out. No, I don't think so. I don't think he was robbing banks Mm. since he was a teenager. But we're going to flip back to America now with his arrest and subsequent jailing. When he was caught, he had that money on him, as I said. As Angie was his only kind of contact in the area because his son had been shipped back to Scotland, she was nominated to receive the money as a check to hold on to for him. He also had gold coins on him. Angie also had that. And she sold them and she sold his van and the proceeds she kept for her trouble (laughs) but she did say that she sent the money to his son minus a few thousand yet kim says she didn't send it at all right okay so there's some blurred lines there there is some blurred lines kind of like the scammer kind of got scammed a little bit exactly and also too the scammer got scammed by the woman who dobbed him in 
And then he gave her all the money. So what was he thinking? He didn't know that at that point. She didn't divulge that yet. Right. But in August 2019, he was sent home to Scotland. He chose to go home to Scotland with an escort. And Angie followed. She thought, well, I've got the money. (laughs) I have always wanted to go to Scotland. Why not? And also, I think she found him quite intriguing. And she wasn't buying all his lies. So off she went to visit him over a period of two trips. At one point while she was there... Avis convinced her to help him escape from prison and he asked her to do things like print Google Earth pictures of the prison out and send them to him. When that didn't work, he tried to take himself out with the bins, but that didn't work either. (laughs) So he's still in prison. Bring a toothbrush with a sharp end, you know, all of that kind of bullshit stuff. (laughs) Oh my God, he's crazy. Before they parted ways, Angie confessed to Avis that she had been the one to turn him in. And she said it was because it was in response to a huge lie that he told her, which was that he was American. That was just one lie too far. She's like, no, <laughs> dude, yeah, you've messed with the wrong American lady here. Listen, mate. So, listen, dude, you're... Listen, guy. Listen, guy, don't fuck with me. Obviously, he was furious about this and he never contacted her again. Yeah. <laughs> Then he went on to be tried in Scotland for 24 charges against four women, mostly for rape and sexual assault. Two of his victims were classed as children at the time because they were underage. And all of the charges describe a violent, controlling and sadistic man. One victim gave evidence via a screen because they didn't want to be seen or they didn't want to be in the same room as him and told the court how as a teenager... Avis had bought her a smoothie that made her feel strange (gasps) and then he raped her. Oh my God, he drugged her. I know, he drugged her. And what followed were multiple incidences of attempted rape, sexual assault and actual rape. She told the court how he would then, and this is the trigger, he would then threaten to cut his wrists or kill himself if she'd ever tell anyone, told anyone about these things. And this tactic was used with other victims, along with other forms of self-abuse, such as hitting his head and abuse of them by putting his hands around their throats. So he was a wild, unpredictable and violent man who was so manipulative. Dude, cut the wrists. No one cares. Go bang your head on a wall. Well, it was distressing for these young victims. Yeah, of course. It was distressing for them, you know, and you don't know how you'll behave in these situations. No, and he's manipulated them as well. While his victims gave evidence, even if there was a screen separating them, Avis would try and put them off by making weird noises and passing (laughs) notes throughout so he could distract them and make them feel diminished and try and assert his power over them. This is the sort of guy he was. And at one point, his team turned the tables on Jade the girl who he isolated in the caravan because it was her who first broke the silence and after that, loads of people signed up to press charges. So they turned the tables on her while she was giving evidence. They said it was her who abused him because little did Jade know, he was secretly taping all of their arguments and at one time, (gasps) after he hurt himself with an axe and went to A&E, while he was there, he reported to medics that it was Jade who attacked him. So the defence team claimed her story was concocted as a way to get money out of Avis because obviously there's money even though we don't know where it's come from he is a fucking narcissist who like Keith Ranieri taping everything oh my god Avis denied all the charges of course he maintained that these women were just out for his money and that they were all lying all four of them he was also on trial for missing his original court date which he claimed happened as a result of a mental breakdown but actually he went to America and faked his own death but there was a lot (laughs) more details from the podcast that if you're interested you really should take a listen because it's amazing and Miles Bonner's investigative journalism uncovers a lot of really intriguing aspects so I haven't really given too much away obviously the start the middle and the end but it would be an interesting listen for sure. It sounds like a wild ride. (laughs) Avis's trial concluded with the prosecution claiming that he was controlling and aggressive and the court found Avis guilty of 14 charges between 2007 and 2016 against all four women. And upon hearing the verdict, he shouted, it's a tragic day for truth and justice, Your Honour, before being taken down. Dickhead. I know. He was then imprisoned for 15 years, 12 for the crimes against the four women and three for missing the original court date. This was not the end of the podcast, but it's where I'm going to leave it because I urge you to listen. There's plenty more intrigue and avenues. And of course, 
We still don't know much about his family of origin. But what I did to try and answer my questions that I had about that, I went to Reddit to see some responses to the TV documentary on an Inverness-based forum. So here we have a few messages in response to that TV documentary that was aired earlier this year, 2024. F1 Boogie, and this were all posted about four months ago, says, what I have heard is that he came from a well-off family that had disowned him. There were always rumors around his private life and his past life. It's hard to pick out what ones are true. I even heard the real stretch was that he was part of the Avis car hire family. This, of course, has very little chance of being true. We don't know. Hmm. Tatty Mafia said he has well-off parents who live in Drummond Road. She even knows the address where they live. I think they bought him a place when him and his pregnant girlfriend were living in his van. So she's got some history there. There could be some legs to that one. It could be legs. Overstuffed Cherub said, I had a couple of alternative type friends who almost idolized him. He had all of the coolest jewelry at his stall, but he always gave me the heebie-jeebies. He just always looked dirty and weird to me. (laughs) (laughs) Ah! And he was a fucking creep. (laughs) And I'll let this be the last post from Reddit because it's fantastic. And it wraps up the story perfectly. Pulsating Sphincter says... (laughs) Good name. I used to see him near Lloyd's Bank. He was a complete wanker. (laughs) Full stop. (laughs) And that's the end of my wrap up of Dead Man Running, the story of Kim Vincent Avis. Oh, my God. What a crazy ride. This guy, narcissist, manipulator. And you can never tell what's truth no yeah what's the truth there's no finding out with him no and these women you know they clearly weren't after the money because they didn't get any money from him well i think there was some money exchanged at different points for some of the girlfriends Mm, some of the wives obviously i think that jade was a recipient of some money at some point you don't know the full story he had her credit cards yeah he did because he was isolating her yeah he wasn't using her money to you know he wasn't spending her money he didn't need to i don't think was an issue for him and it was never a motivation no it was the sex it was the power it was the control exactly but he thought clearly in a premeditated way he was going to always frame these women if they ever had any comeback on him yeah he was preparing yeah he was he was preparing he was gathering collateral just like ranieri yeah. did fuck man i'd never even heard of this story thank you yeah knickers Yannickers from uh, <laughs> Yannickers, Yannicka from Amsterdam. Wow, Jordi. Well, thank you so much for that story. And my pleasure. You know, it's been a ride for these poor women. First, who were being lied to by policemen, and then lied to by a pretend punk rocker. So, fuck. Be careful. That's the message here. That's the take home. If you're getting creep vibes, listen to it. It's a trust exercise, isn't it? And if you get your trust burned, like you said about your the victims in your story, mm. they will have trust issues for the rest of their lives. And it's not always beneficial to have those, really, because it can affect no. every aspect of your life. And it's depressing. It's sad. It's upsetting. Oh, well, on that wonderful note... <laughs> I think, Jordy, there really is only three things left for us to say. Wherever you are, whatever you do, just, just keep, keep eavesdropping. 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 Eavesdropping.